A Course in What? with Cynthia Morgan. Hey, course friends, welcome to A Course in What? I'm Cynthia Morgan, and this is a podcast in which I read and discuss the text of A Course in Miracles. And A Course in What? is a free weekly podcast that comes out each Tuesday. And thank you so much for joining me today on this podcast episode number 43. So I thought that I would open this podcast up to some of you, the listeners out there, in terms of your stories about how you found A Course in Miracles or how it found you, as that seems to happen, and where you're with it now in terms of your study and the lessons or your progress with it sort of your journey with the course. And I don't want to take up too much time in the beginning of the podcast, but, and I won't do it each time, but occasionally I thought it'd be nice to share some different stories. So I'm interested in that, and I hope that you would find that interesting as well. So if you feel inspired, please email me your story at a course in what at gmail.com. And you can also go to our Facebook page, facebook.com forward slash A Course in What. And you could message the story there as well. And I can't remember how much of my story I told about finding A Course in Miracles, but I know that if you go back to that first podcast episode, um, if some of you are joining us now and listen to that, you'll hear part of my story of finding A Course in Miracles. And if you happen upon this podcast a year from now, three years from now, um, I would still like to hear your story because we'll still be reading A Course in Miracles, I'm sure. So I thought I would start today with my husband, Brad Klopman's story. He writes, I first came across the course through a very random synchronous series of events. I was 20 years old in December of 2005 and I was skiing in Utah with my dad, his friend, and his two kids my own age. They wanted to ski a different resort that, with the lack of recent snow, seemed more challenging than fun. But my dad's friend insisted we go there anyway. My dad chickened out, knowing it wouldn't be a fun, groomed day, but rather a steep, bumpy day of skiing. Leaving me with no choice but to go along, I said to myself, Just try and enjoy today and not act annoyed. Midway through the day, we took a large tram up the mountain. All four of us jammed in with 30 plus other skiers. I lost them in the mad dash inside and ended up crammed next to strangers. Keeping to myself and just waiting for the tram to arrive, an older father-son duo behind me started talking about the recent film, What the Bleep Do We Know?, And having been a fan and supporter of the film, I turned around and started chatting with them about it. I actually don't remember anything we talked about. I just remember the dad was in his 60s and the son was in his late 30s. We reached the top of the mountain and everyone scattered out to put on their skis. And as I was getting ready, the dad came up and said to me something I'll never forget. I want to recommend two books to you, The Eye of the Eye and The Disappearance of the Universe. I thanked him and wrote them down in my old Motorola Razor cell phone and skied away. Later that day, I went to the Expanding Heart bookstore in Park City to look for those books, and surprisingly, they had them both. I bought them. They seemed like rather lengthy, time-consuming books for me at the time to read, so I didn't even open them up for months. Then during the summer of 2006, I interned at a film production company in Los Angeles and had a lot of free time at night. I had brought both of those books with me to L.A. with the intention of reading them that summer. Sometime that first week, I looked at them and couldn't decide which one to read first. I literally flipped a coin, and the disappearance of the universe won. I still haven't read the other one yet. I had no idea what A Course in Miracles was at the time and had never even heard of it. I read Disappearance of the Universe in a matter of days. I even remember sitting at work reading it instead of the movie scripts I had to cover. So in the fall of 2006, I finally got the actual book of A Course in Miracles. 
and I'm on my third go around of the lessons. I'll never forget that guy who came up to me to recommend those books. I wish I could find him today and thank him. He steered my life in a completely different direction and everything I'd been seeking spiritually all those previous years finally made sense when I found the course. I always loved that story that Brad tells about finding A Course in Miracles because it really is a story of these random synchronous events of flipping a coin and going skiing on a day he didn't want to go. And I find that so interesting. I never get tired of hearing or thinking about that story of flipping the coin and finding A Course in Miracles because if it landed the other way, who knows? if he would have ever ended up reading The Disappearance of the Universe, like he's never read the other book. And that is what led him to A Course in Miracles. And truly, that's why we are together, is because of our connection to A Course in Miracles and that it's our spiritual path. So we probably wouldn't even be married if he had flipped that coin and it landed on the eye for an eye or whatever that was. Anyway, I, it's an awesome story. So I would love to hear your story. and. In the meantime, let's continue on with where we were at in our reading. We're on chapter three, The Innocent Perception, section six, Judgment and the Authority Problem, and we are on paragraph four. That's on page 47 in your text. And as this section is titled, we are talking about judgment. And eventually, at the end of this section, we're going to get into the authority problem. And this discussion, of course, on judgment continues from the last podcast episode, number 42, where we read the first three paragraphs and talked a lot about judgment. Paragraph four, sentence one. You are very fearful of everything you have perceived, but have refused to accept. So you could insert the word judged for perceived because perception rests on judgment. So you are very fearful of everything you have judged, but have refused to accept. We can't accept what we judge. That's why we are judging it. Um, judgment is really outside of ourselves. And what does it mean to accept? I think it means to see it as one with us, a creation or something that's made up in our own mind. Acceptance to me seems to be the opposite of judgment. So let's read that one more time. You are very fearful of everything you have perceived, but have refused to accept. Two, you believe that because you have refused to accept it, you have lost control over it. It, I believe, means everything that we have perceived. Rather than see it as made up in our mind, we see it as outside of ourselves, really having a life outside of us. And then we are, as it says, very fearful of it. Because truly separation is a very vulnerable position. We don't have that strength of connection to God. Three. This is why you see it in nightmares or in pleasant disguises in what seem to be your happier dreams. So everything that we perceive is a product of judgment, ultimately the judgment of separation. Therefore, what we consider to be nightmares, and I don't think Jesus is talking about our nighttime sleep scary nightmares, though those would be included in this, of course, but rather he means that everything is scary to us and is a nightmare or a happy dream. And the happy dream would include those times that we feel we are happy because of something external to us, a person, a relationship, money, a career, opportunities, travel, whatever that is. Not that any of those things are wrong. Please don't see it as that. But I think he's just trying to get us to see that even when we have those happier dreams, they are based on us getting something. They're still based in separation, in a dream of misperception. 
Again, there's nothing wrong with being happy because we got a job promotion or bought a house. But on another level, we recognize that we could go even deeper. Those things can all be taken away from us. Therefore, there needs to be a deeper sustainment of our happiness or our peace. So that's why he says they're pleasant disguises in what seems to be your happier dreams or nightmare. So basically, it's all the same, right? It's all the idea of separation. And, you know, obviously, we're talking on a very metaphysical level. Four, nothing that you have refused to accept can be brought into awareness. So nothing that we can judge can be brought into awareness because it's all an illusion. Five, it is not dangerous in itself, but you have made it seem dangerous to you. Now, this could mean that judgment isn't dangerous in and of itself, but we've used it in a way that seems dangerous to us. The Course tells us that the right use of judgment, and there is a right use of judgment, and that's to judge against the ego. Or this could mean that, or I should say, and, or and, this could mean that what we are judging isn't dangerous in and of itself because it's an illusion. But by our judgment, we've made that particular thing or person or situation seem dangerous. We've made our own nightmares. Paragraph five, sentence one. When you feel tired, it is because you have judged yourself as capable of being tired. That's an interesting statement. He's not saying that we're tired because we're anemic and we don't have enough iron. He's saying we're tired because we've judged ourselves as being capable of being tired. So again, it's that judgment that is hurting us. Two, when you laugh at someone, it is because you have judged him as unworthy. So laughing at someone is judging him or her. And when we judge another, we must be taking that God superiority point of view. Because who are we to judge another who is one with us and equal to us? We judge when we see them as unworthy. It's just another insidious ego attempt to usurp God in our mind. It gives us that power, that all-knowingness, that we are worthy of judging somebody who's unworthy. Three, when you laugh at yourself, you must laugh at others if only because you cannot tolerate the idea of being more unworthy than they are. This is just a way of saying you first have to laugh at yourself if you're going to laugh at other people. You first have judged yourself if you're going to judge other people. You first see yourself as unworthy if you see other people as unworthy. Um, So when he's saying you laugh at yourself, that's just another way of saying when you judge yourself as less than then you'll judge other people or other non-humans in the same way. So basically, the worse we feel about ourselves, the greater the need will be to project that out onto others. Four, all this makes you feel tired because it is essentially disheartening. It's a great deal of strain to judge ourselves so harshly and to constantly be judging others. It makes us tired. Five, you are not really capable of being tired, but you are very capable of wearying yourself. Here he's distinguishing a little bit between being tired and being capable of wearying ourselves. Um, Tired feels like it's already an end result. Wearying ourselves, to me, just feels like we're running ourselves ragged with our judgments. Um... It's not that we're actually tired. We are just bombarding ourselves, wearing ourselves down with our judgments. And that's of ourselves and others. I mean, really, we don't judge others as harshly, even those people who are constantly judging other people harshly, than we do ourselves. So there first has to be this pounding within ourselves of this judgment. Six, 
The strain of constant judgment is virtually intolerable. It's virtually intolerable um, because we still do it. So we're still tolerating it on some level. And I wonder how much of this constant judgment, this strain, is contributing to sickness and even death. We judge ourselves and others to death. Seven, it is curious that an ability so debilitating would be so deeply cherished. And why do we cherish judgment? Because it sustains the ego and thus the dream of separation, the individuality. If I'm judging you, then I've put myself in a false sense of power. Again, I've usurped God in my mind that I'm even capable of judging you. The ego doesn't want to give that up. A. Yet if you wish to be the author of reality, you will insist on holding on to judgment. So we can't really be the author of reality because we didn't create ourselves. We authored a dream, but that's a temporary illusion. It's like my body. Cynthia Morgan, living in 2015, like this is temporary. This is me in my dream of being Cynthia Morgan. I've authored this dream. But I can't really author reality with a capital R. However, the ego tells us that this dream of individuality and separation is very real. And through our judgments, we are getting something of value. And here Jesus is starting to get to the second part of the title of this section, Judgment and the Authority Problem, by saying, yet if you wish to be the author of reality. Basically, the authority problem is the problem that we believe we authored ourselves. And when we believe that we author ourselves, we usurp God in our minds. That's a big problem with a capital P. Nine, you will also regard judgment with fear, believing that it will someday be used against you. The flip side to the value the ego sees in judgment is that we are also afraid of it. We are afraid of everyone and everything. You may recall that We talked about that from an earlier podcast episode. If we judge someone so harshly, then we know we are capable of being judged harshly. And by whom? By God. That's what the ego tells us, that God is fear, that God is the great judger, that we're going to have our judgment day. And I'm not talking about Christianity. I'm talking that all of us have this fear of God. Otherwise, we would be at one with him. Otherwise, we would be choosing love in every moment. And how many people really do that? And why don't they do that? Because they're afraid of love. They're afraid of God. So this is a very deep unconscious issue in everybody's mind, or most everybody, not It's not entirely true for everybody. There are people who have healed that judgment, healed that fear and guilt, and transcended it. And truthfully, we can do that as well in every moment. We just don't sustain it. And as I talked about in the last podcast episode, when you use that lesson Today I will judge nothing that occurs. In that moment, you are in unity with God because you're in the present moment and at peace. There is no separation in that. There's just peace in your mind. But we have a hard time sustaining that. 10. This belief can exist only to the extent that you believe in the efficacy of judgment as a weapon of defense for your own authority. So again, judgment keeps the dream of individuality alive. 
It's a weapon of defense for our own authority. And all of this would no longer exist if we let go of that judgment. This belief can exist only to the extent that you believe in the efficacy of judgment. So all of this craziness and fear would disappear. Paragraph 6, sentence 1. God offers only mercy. God doesn't judge. God is love. I love that word mercy. It's sort of looking at someone lost or struggling with a loving gaze, offering kindness. It's a beautiful word. Two, your words should reflect only mercy because that is what you have received and that is what you should give. Hugely important sentence of A Course in Miracles as I'm reading this. Your words should reflect only mercy because that is what you have received and that is what you should give. So whatever else A Course in Miracles is about, this terminology, these lessons, blah, 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 really here he's telling us that you've been given mercy, you've been given love, you've been forgiven, and that is what you should be giving. Your words and ultimately your behavior should reflect mercy. And that's what we should be giving to the world, to our brothers. And I don't just mean our fellow human beings, but to non-human beings as well. Mercy is giving someone in a bad situation kindness, help, love, your hand. That's mercy. It begins in your mind, it extends to your words, and it shines into the world through your behavior. Let us all be merciful rather than judgmental. Three. Justice is a temporary expedient or an attempt to teach you the meaning of mercy. Justice is good. We need justice in the world. I'm a Libra. My sign is the symbol of a scale. It's the symbol of justice. I think about Gandhi, who was a Libra, and he was a lawyer. He worked for justice. I too feel that Libraness of being all about justice. But here Jesus is saying that that's only a layover on the way to mercy. Justice helps us to learn how to be merciful. But it isn't the same thing. A court of law can uphold justice, but it will never be merciful. That comes from God. But we can start by being just. And through that justice, he's saying, it will teach you the meaning of mercy. Four, it is judgmental only because you are capable of injustice. So it meaning justice, I believe, is judgmental because even justice is all a part of the dream, right? at least in the way that he's using it here. This dream of separation is the big injustice. And because we are unjust, we need to correct that and be just. And that will eventually lead us up that ladder to mercy, to forgiveness, to awakening from the dream of separation. Okay, so I think we'll stop there for today. And if you would like to stay in touch with me, again, you can contact me through the Facebook page at facebook.com forward slash A Course in What. And you can go to my website, cynthiamorgan.us to contact me. And the podcast is also up on the website for those of you that didn't know that. And again, if you want to share your story, I won't say names, but um, I'll just read your story to uh, the rest of the listeners. 
and I look forward to hearing from you. So, all right. If you would like to say the summary of A Course in Miracles with me, that would be great. Nothing real can be threatened. Nothing unreal exists. Herein lies the peace of God.